1971, Peter Sloan published an article titled The Economics of Professional Football, the football club as a utility maximizer. It laid bare the ideological differences between the North American and European sporting cultures. In the United States, there'd always been an assumption that sports teams should be profit maximizers and therefore be organized as closed leagues to protect the sports clubs against the economic penalty of relegation. Conversely, in Europe, where leagues were open and had promotion and relegation, utility maximization, the desire to prioritize sporting success, was the true objective. Profit, or underwriting losses, was only important insofar as it was necessary for a club's long-term stability and survival. And this economic concept is the bedrock behind the implementation of financial fair play. Now, there have been various examples of owners in England that have tried to run football clubs as profit maximizers. Alan Sugar, a notorious businessman, tried his arm at running his beloved Tottenham Hotspur as a profit maximizer, and looks back on the experience as having wasted 10 years trying to do something great for that football club. From 1991 to 2001, Sugar ran Spurs within their means. Most of their fans hated the period, with the League Cup being the solitary trophy in a period of mid-table mediocrity. The club only managed to make £2 million a year in profits over the first six years, which was much less than their local rivals Arsenal who were competing at a much higher level. Importantly, Sugar's ownership illustrates a paradox in running a football club, as Stefan Zemanski and Simon Cooper describe in their book Soconomics. When business people try to run a football club as a business, then not only does the football suffer, but so does the business. In an open system of promotion and relegation, utility maximization is the only way to survive. That being said, Without financial regulations, football clubs are at risk of overextending to the point of threatening their existence, and a classic example of this is Leeds United. In 2001, the club reached the semi-finals of the Champions League and were one of the more consistently competitive teams in the Premier League. Under the guidance of chairman Peter Ridsdale, the club had taken out a number of loans against the prospect of achieving Champions League football, which they narrowly missed out on in 2000-2001 and the following season. Due to consecutive seasons without the Champions League revenue, the club was unable to repay their loans and were forced to sell valuable assets such as Rio Ferdinand to Manchester United. With Leeds leaking players due to their debts, on-pitch performances suffered and the club plummeted out of the top flight. Leeds failed to stop the rot in the Championship and were forced to dismantle the squad further and sell both their training ground and their stadium in 2004. The club finally entered administration in 2007 were given a 10-point deduction for failing to control their finances and were relegated to the third division for the first time in their history. Now, Leeds fans can feel comfort in the fact that they are far from alone. In fact, between the year 2000 and 2008, 42 football league clubs entered administration, 17 in 2002 and 2003 alone. In reaction to this plight of poorly managed football clubs, an inquiry was held in the House of Commons Culture, Media and Sport Committee into the governance of English football in 2011 and 2013. Two of the leading sport economists present, Stefan Zemanski and Sean Hamill, had opposing views on the habitual loss-making of football clubs. Zemanski argued that a lack of profitability didn't actually matter considering that there was always a new owner ready to step in and pick up the bill. Hamill, however, stated that financial instability led to the cannibalization of the rest of the sporting pyramid to pay increased wages, citing the case of Glasgow Rangers in the SPL. There was also the moral issue of taxpayers effectively picking up the bill for mismanaged football clubs. When a club is put into administration, the football creditors rule ensures that all football-related debts, e.g. to the players, coaching staff and to other clubs, are to be paid first and in full. This essentially means that the taxman is one of the last creditors to be repaid their debts, and HMRC typically only receives between 5 and 10% of what they are actually owed. Equally problematic is the fact that despite going into administration, football clubs very rarely go extinct. In 2002, Leicester City went into administration and paid HMRC £700,000 of the £7 million it owned. 14 years later, Leicester won the Premier League. While the country reveled in the underdog story of the century, it is worth contemplating how heroic the story really is. The wider context of European football's finances is equally important to understanding why regulation was necessary. In the late 1990s, European football club revenues dramatically increased thanks to the rise of pay-per-view TV. The Bosman case, however, allowed players to have more bargaining power, meaning that the increased revenue largely translated to an increase in player wages. In an interview with the BBC, Alan Sugar described this phenomenon as the prune juice effect when discussing the Premier League's new TV deal, 
If anyone knows the effect of prune juice, it's very simple. It goes in one end and comes out the other. And that's exactly what's going to happen with this money. With larger sums of money in the game, the risk of financial mismanagement was much higher. Professor Egon Frank summarized the situation. In the end, managerial moral hazard and rent-seeking tend to be infinitely repeated games in a league where the expectation of being bailed out had become part of the collective experience. The potential arms race mutates into a zombie race, where the entire league operates on the verge of insolvency, chronically expending more than its earnings, but being systematically rescued by external money injections year after year. And the real threat from UEFA's point of view, however, were the clubs themselves. And after the global economic crash in 2008, the European governing body came to two conclusions. Firstly, that this chronic loss-making was not sustainable, and the threat of a breakaway European Super League with no promotion or relegation was increasing, with the big clubs growing tired of chronic loss-making. Well, the answer? A form of financial regulation, which is effectively a soft salary cap to control club expenditure and turn clubs into reasonably stable institutions. And UEFA called it financial fair play. Thank you.